DT webinar. I'm talking to you from my home in the Rhone Valley about this area and I hope I can transport you here virtually. The presentation is about uh, 45 minutes of slides and then there should be time for some questions uh, afterwards. And if you have a glass of Rome wine with you on this journey, so much the better. Enjoy. If we haven't met before, I'm Linda, I'm British and a resident of the Rome Valley. I worked in London for about 20 years, but never in the wine trade. And my interest in wine led me to do the WSET qualifications through the WSET School London and I became a wine educator. I moved to the Rhone about 12 years ago and set up the house in this photo as the Auberge du Van, where I run wine holidays and I now teach the WSET qualifications myself. So I need to credit Interrhone, who are the generic trade body for the Rhone Valley region because they have supplied some of the slides in this presentation and some of the statistics. Um, their website, vanrhone.com, is a really useful source of information on Rhone wines. If you're studying them or just a, a generally interested in them, um, it's got loads of uh, information. However, the views expressed today are my own in the presentation. And I've also listed there my email address. If anybody doesn't feel like asking questions on the webinar, but uh, would like to contact me afterwards with any queries about Rome wines, happy to uh, answer them by email. So here's an outline of what I'm going to be looking at today on this presentation. In the first part, we're going to be looking at an introduction to the area, the geography, the names of the wines and their commercial profile. And in the second part, I'd like to try and give you more of a bit of an insider's view of the Southern Rhone. And we'll be looking specifically at the harvest here this year what's new in the Rhone Valley wine world and what people here in the wine world are actually thinking and talking about, what's on their minds. So to start, for those of you who are around the world, it's wonderful to hear we have South Africa and Peru uh, and Portugal, people from all around. Um, here's my area of the world. Uh, and it's a bit of a small slide, but you can probably see at the very top where I'm pointing here is the city of Lyon. And at the bottom here is the port city of Marseille on the Mediterranean. And in between, the Rhone River runs from north to south and the area sort of shaded on the map are the Rhone Valley vineyards. It's roughly divided into two parts, the north and the south. Um, and we think of it with a sort of imaginary line about halfway across here through Montalimar, dividing the north from the south Rhone Valley. I live um, just east of Avignon in the south here, uh, just around here where I'm pointing now. You can already see, uh, although it's difficult to see the names, you can see from the size of the vineyard area that the north is a much smaller area and actually only produces about 5% of the total wine production by volume. But it does have half of the top winemaking villages. So it's a small production of very high quality wines in the north. The south, by comparison, is uh, much, uh, much larger. So here are the sort of key points of difference between the north and the southern Rhone. In the northern Rhone, 
the grapes are the majority of the grapes are uh, wines are made from single varietal grapes so the two that you might recognize would be Syrah black grape Syrah and Viognier so you get wines made 100% of those grapes up here in the uh, northern Rhone by contrast the wines in the southern Rhone are blended wines and they tend to be from an, a large number of varietals you can use up to 30 different grape varieties here but the most prevalent is the grape Grenache which is a Spanish grape variety which really uh, responds well to the hot Mediterranean climate of the south. In terms of the soils or the terroir the north is mainly granite based Whereas in the south, there are a large number of different types of terroir and soils, um, but probably limestone is uh, the most common, but clay and sand are also present. And as I've mentioned, there's a slight difference in a climate. The northern Rhone has much more of a semi-continental climate, whereas the, the south is hotter, a more Mediterranean climate. So what does that um, translate into? Uh, what does the area look like? Well, here's a picture, some pictures from the northern Rhone of the topography. The grapes in the north are planted on the steep slopes of the Rhone River. And because the gradients is so uh, steep, they have to be planted in terraces. And they use a particular training system here called the Eshala. And you can see that on the right hand side of the, um, of the picture there. That's how they train their vines. Much of the vineyard work has to be done by hand because the tractors cannot get up onto these terraces as it's just too steep. The south, by contrast, is much more undulating, as you can see from the pictures here. So vineyards are bigger and easier to manage with machines, such as tractors and harvesters. The vines are also interspersed with trees or scrubland called garrigue. Many grape growers also diversify by growing Olive, olives through olive trees, they grow lavender, or even truffles. Truffles are very big around here. They're grown underneath oak trees. But we have hedgerows of conifers or poplar trees to act as windbreaks for the mistral wind. And the mistral wind um, is, uh, is a, a very strong, can be a very, very strong wind which comes from north, flows from north to south. It comes down the Rhone Valley from the north. Um, and it's often uh, a wind that happens after we've had rain. So the rain tends to come in from the south, and which is what's happening today. We've had quite a bit of rain from the south today. And so tomorrow, the Mistral is going to kick in and it's going to push all those rain clouds back away. So it's known as the winemaker's friend because it prevents rot and mildew happening in the damp vineyards. So it's, it's very, very good for the vines. This is just looking at more of the commercial side of the Rhone. Um, the Rhone is the second largest quality wine region in France. And here we've said in 2017, there were 372 million bottles sold. And that's quite incredible. That, if you think about it, that's about over a million bottles a day are produced in this region. So it's a huge area of production. In terms of the colors of the wine, the, this is still a big red wine country. 74% of the vineyards are growing red grapes. 
Um, 16% are, are growing grapes for rosé wine. Now that has certainly increased in the last um, 10 years as consumer demand across the world. I'm sure everyone's experienced that in their home markets that uh, rosé seems to have suddenly become fashionable um, and uh, is continuing to sell well um, across the world. There's 10% of white grapes grown in this region, um, but we've also seen a lot of consumer demand for Rhone white wines increasing in the last couple of years. So Interone have now got a big project to identify where these white grapes grow best, and they will be expanding their planting in these areas for future wine production. So do look out for those uh, white wines coming from the, uh, the, the Rhone Valley. Um, we've mentioned the grape varieties before. We've mentioned Viognier, um, but they're also Grenache Blanc is very big, um, Bourbon Blanc and a couple of other different white grapes. But uh, if you haven't tried one, do try a white Rhone if you get the chance. Of the wines produced, only 33% is actually exported, which quite surprises me that there's a really big demand for Rome wines here in France. So they sell really well here. And of the 33% that are exported, in the box on the right hand side, you can see the major export markets. Now the US and the uh, UK are sort of vie for the number one position, but they're both currently about 16% of the export market. Um, both have commercial pressures uh, in those markets, which we'll talk about a li little bit more later. But I should also note here China. Um, China has really increased strongly in the last 10 years in their demand for Rome wines. 10 years ago, they were importing about half a million bottles of wine. But now, uh, last in 2018, they actually imported 11 million bottles of Rome wine, bringing them up to the um, fourth biggest export market for the Rome wines. Now, this is a busy slide. Um, and it's a bit difficult to see. I'm trying to do two things on this slide. I want, first of all, to, to show you the appellations or the named regions of the Rhone Valley, as well as the relative size of production. So if we look on, if you can see uh, on your screen on the right hand side there, the production of the area known as the Côte du Rhone is about 70% of the production of the Rhone Valley as a whole. And the other 30% are made up of what are called the other appellations of the Rhone Valley. Now that's a number of different appellations. The biggest is the Vontu Appalachian Controle, which is where I am now. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about later that makes up 9% of the total production of the Rhone Valley. But for this slide, I'm going to move across to the pyramid here, which explains the quality levels of the Côte de Rhone wines, which, as I say, is 70% of the production of the Rhone Valley. <clears throat> if we start at the bottom of the pyramid, the regional Côte de Rhone wines make up about 46% of the production of the Rhone Valley. So these are wines which will just say Côte de Rhone on the, on the label on the bottle. These are good everyday drinking wines. But if you move up the pyramid a little bit, you get to what are called the village wines. And there are two types of village wines. They are, uh, can you hear okay? Yep. 
Okay, the village wines make up about 13% of the total production. And there are 95 villages in all. Um, and 21 of those villages can actually add the name of their village onto the bottle of wine. So, for example, they will have Côte de Rhône village dash sable. And that means they're one of the, the 21 special villages of the uh, Côte de Rhône, and they can actually use the name of their village. Mm. Then at the top of the pyramid, we have what are called the Cru wines. And you will have heard of Chateauneuf du Pape because that's probably the most famous Cru village in the Rhone Valley. But there are another 16 of them. And uh, these will all be covered on a WSET level three course if you are planning to do that or if you've already covered that on uh, WSET level three. So there we are, that's all the, um, a little bit of the background there for you. That's, we've covered the geography of the region. We've looked at the landscape and, and what that looks like. And we've looked at the names of some of these regions. And so now we can focus on what's actually happening in the Rhone Valley today. Here's um, again a picture of the Auberge de Van where I live and I wanted to show you some photos from around the house. You can see from this aerial photograph that I'm surrounded by vines for neighbours. It's a bit different to the view of the metropolitan line that I used to have from my old flat in London. A bit more, um, a bit greener and not so noisy. So here's a view from the house, there's a photo I've taken from the house looking north. And you can see the vineyards here. Um, this, all these vineyards you can see come under the Vontu appellation that I mentioned earlier, producing about 9% of the Rhone, uh, of the wines of the Rhone Valley. Some of you will recognize Mont Ventoux if you are a cyclist, it's a classic stage of the Tour de France. I can see people nodding there. <laughs> um, but uh, you can see the wide flat areas uh, ahead of uh, Mont Ventoux. These are ideal for mechanization. It's very easy. The vines are planted uh, in spaciously so that tractors can get through and weed and trim the vines and the mechanical harvesters can come out and actually harvest uh, the grapes at this time of year. There are actually vines up to about 400 meters on Mont Ventoux. Chateau Pesquier has the highest vines at about uh, 400 meters or that's 1200 feet. So now it's time to meet my neighbors. May I introduce you to Madame Viognier. This is literally the, the parcel of land that's just outside of the, uh, just outside of my window here. And um, my friend Karen, who should be on the call, uh, introduced me to a game which characterizes great varieties as actors. And we decided that if Viognier was an actor, she would be Mae West. She's voluptuous, generous, spicy, and fruity. That's your Viognier. On the, outs um, the south side of the house, we have a parcel here of Grenache. Now, I think uh, Grenache uh, is, is a female grape. I like uh, to think of her as female. And if she was an actor, I think uh, Salma Hayek or perhaps even Penelope Cruz, attractive, friendly, approachable, but can be intoxicating. The wines do improve with age, as do those actors. 
Um, and for those of you who with sharp eyes, you can possibly see at the bottom of this photo um, an irrigation hose. And just to note that in this area, you can irrigate vines up to, um, up to for their first three years. So these are actually two year old vines which have been irrigated this year, but I'll be touching a bit more on irrigation a bit further on. My third neighbor is Monsieur Sira. For me, this is Sean Connery as James Bond. Smooth, fruity, everyone's attracted to him. He's often traveling around South America or Australia, but he's always a class act and the accent never changes. For Karen, he's Antonio Banderas. He can be serious, brooding, and he adds gravitas. So there you are, that's a sort of uh, run through of my neighbors and the, the major grapes around the house and the major grapes of the Southern Rome. So now we're gonna move on and look a little bit at the harvest here. So it's early days, um, and, but looking at the growing season from March until September till today, um, we started with some frost in some parts in March. And again, some areas of the Rhone had hail damage at the end of May. But otherwise, it was a warm spring and a consistent hot summer. There was very little rain this year. And in fact, limited irrigation has been authorized for Côte du Rhône and Côte du Rhône village wines between mid-July and mid-August. They stop it at the, the middle of August because they don't want the grapes to swell too much just before the harvest. But this is uh, unusual to have, uh, to have irrigation uh, at this time of year because we've just had a real drought this summer. It was an early harvest. They started picking um, about the uh, end of August um, and it's still go ongoing uh, as we are now. Uh, there's a lot of, um, when I'm driving around, there's a lot of unpicked Grenache out there. Grenache is always the last grape to be picked. They pick the white grapes first uh, and then move on to the Sanso and then the Syrah and last of all, the Grenache. It's a bit too early to make conclusions about um, volumes of wines because not all the grapes are in. Um, and we have got these pockets of frost and hail in various areas. Um, but generally the grapes, people are telling me, are healthy and clean. The only area that has come out with um, bad, some bad news is the Cru village of Taval, which is known for its white, sorry, its rosé wines and they were possibly the worst hit area and they declared that the volumes there will be 30 percent lower this year due to those uh, adverse spring conditions that they experienced so the next couple of slides i wanted to talk a little bit about mechanical harvesting it's not a subject that you see covered in most WSET textbooks. Um, and most books tend to assume that grapes are handpicked. It's also not something that you see at all, I don't think, in, in UK vineyards. Um, usually the crew wines of the Rhone Valley and the smaller parcels of vines are handpicked as, as uh, are the, the wines as we talked about in the Northern Rhone, but much of the wine in the Southern Rhone is actually harvested by these machines. I spoke with the winemaker at the Cellier de Dauphin, which is the largest producer in the Rhone Valley, and they say this year probably 70% of their harvest has been done by machine. 
The reality of living in the Southern Rhone while this harvest, mechanical harvest is going on, means that for three weeks, you have got this drone of machines going on around you. And the harvest started here for me in the Vontu on Monday the 31st of August at 4 a.m. when I was woken up by a mechanical harvester like this right outside my bedroom window starting to harvest the Viognier. So you do have to get used to being woken up by these uh, machines. So how do they work? So you can see here the machine actually straddles the vines. So I've got a row of vines in between. And I've got a nice slide here, thanks to Chateau Pesquier here in the Vontu, who provided this diagram. The machine that we saw there clasps the stem of the vine and it vibrates. You can see the machine is going from left to right here and it violently shakes the stems of the vines. And these vibrations inside the machine cause the berries to fall off their stems and they fall onto a sort of ongoing conveyor or roller inside the machine. This roller then picks up the berries and carries them to the top where the berries under point three there are thrown into reception bins or hoppers at the top of the machine. Meanwhile, there are blowers going which will eject the leaves and the stalks from the machine. So all that you've got in there are hopefully some nice clean berries. This is the back of the machine. And there's me looking into the machine and you can see these vibrating rails that I was trying to describe, which violently shake the stem of the vine, causing the individual berries to fall off into the machine. So that's the machine going up and down uh, they'll go up and down a couple of rows of vines until the hoppers on the top are full of berries. Then the machine will stop and there will be a, um, they will meet up with a tractor with a trailer attached to the back. And if you can see in this picture, they're lifting, there's a man on the top there um, with his headphones on and he's checking that the, the machine is in place uh, and the hopper is lifted up and voila the berries all fall into the trailer on the back of the tractor. The trailer waits until it's had a couple of loads of berries and then it the tractor drives off to the winery so the roads around here are full of tractors with the trailers on the back. This is one of my favorites. This is from the village of uh, near Girondas. I photographed this. These are actually hand-picked grapes in the back of this trailer because they've got lovely, nice, uh, nice round bunches still there. So why do they machine harvest? Well, it's particularly relevant for the larger producers and the cooperatives. Um, and the, one of the main points is you can react really quickly to the local weather conditions. If you see rain coming in, um, you can quickly get your grapes in. You're very responsive um, to the situation. The time as well as you can imagine a mechanical harvester like this picks a hectare of grapes in about an hour is much more efficient than uh, hand picking the grapes they can work uh, early mornings they can work in the dark they've got big headlights on the front of them um, and talking again to Celia de Dauphin 
they actually start their machine harvesting about 2 a.m. And they like to pick the grapes that are going to go into their white and rosé wines at that time in the middle of the night or first thing in the morning because it will preserve the natural freshness and keep the wine, uh, keep the grapes cool until they get to the winery. At the moment, sunrise is about 7 a.m. around here. So you can see they can get in a good five hours work, which you couldn't be able to do if you had people picking in the dark. Another advantage of these machines is that most modern machines take out the leaves and the stalks and therefore you're effectively destemming even before you get to the winery. So the red grapes can go straight into the crusher when they get to the winery. And the last uh, point there is really the downsides of manual labor. Um, here, uh, employees uh, handpicking grapes cost with taxes about 20 euros per hour. They're often Spanish or Eastern European. So therefore the, the teams need accommodation, they need transport. And this year they need extra hygiene measures for, for COVID as well. So there's lots of uh, costs associated with um, manual harvesting that you wouldn't get necessarily with uh, a nice machine. So there you are, that's a little bit of uh, machine harvesting for you. We're now going to look at what's new in the, uh, in the region. And first of all, we're going to look at the promotions in the Appalachians. Remember, we had that pyramid earlier of uh, the, the wines of the Côte de Rhone. Um, and wines, uh, villages do change and villages do move upwards in that pyramid. The ultimate being to become crew status. And the last village to became, become a crew was the village of Keran, uh, which became a crew way back in 2016. Um, but we haven't seen any more since then. But there are also four new villages which can um, add their name to a Côte de Rhone village on the front label of the bottle. So these promotions are in recognition of both the terroir of the village and also the wines produced. So you might not have come across these names before, but do look out for Côte de Rhone Village Saint-Cécile, Côte de Rhone Village Sous la Rousse, Côte de Rhone Village Vaison la Romaine, and in 2018, Côte de Rhone Village saint Andiol. I'll just show you where these uh, villages are on the next slide. Here you are. I mentioned that there were 95 villages which use the term Côte de Rhone village. They're all here in the Southern Rhone. And 21 of them which can use their name are in this red box here. Here's the last one I mentioned, San Andiol. It's just here on the right bank of the Rhone in the Ardèche region. So these are new names that you might see in the marketplace. I actually think Côte de Rhone Village is a very exciting area because the wines I think are excellent value. They don't get as much recognition as the crew wines do, um, but they're worth looking out for in the UK or wherever your home market is. Really good value wines. Uh, again, the feedback from, the, from Joe from the Celia de Dauphin was that they're launching um, next year, I think, a range of specifically village na named wines. Um, so they will be making a big feature of that in the future. But if you want to try one of the Celia de Dauphin village wines, they currently have, if you're in the UK market, 
their Côte village wine in Waitrose, which is very good, and that sells for about $9.99. Um, another wine recommendation from this area, uh, I had this uh, earlier and I was, uh, didn't have time unfortunately to advise you all of it before the uh, presentation, but I chose a wine from um, Aldi because I thought many of you are in the UK and this is one that is therefore widely accessible through Aldi. And um, this is the wine, it's, it's just called Côte Village. This is the 2019 vintage that I've got, but it's currently the 2018 is the vintage that's available in uh, Aldi shops in the UK market. Um, and as I say, really good value. Um, I've actually got one here, which I opened earlier. Um, so if those of you who are uh, on the call, if you've got a wine, uh, it might be worth um, having a, a sip of your wine now and perhaps we can share that later after I've done the presentation. But this is, a, as I say, a good example of a uh, Côte d'Oron Village wine. It's a, a lovely um, medium intensity ruby colour because of its youth. On the nose, there's some lovely ripe cherry and raspberry fruit coming through there. Very yummy. On the palate, it's a medium bodied wine. It's got um, low tannins and a lovely smooth finish. It's a, a very easy drinking wine. As I say, that's a Côte d'Oron Village from, uh, from Aldi. So moving on then to what else is new in the Rhone Valley? I think it's worth just uh, highlighting the region's commitment to sustainable agriculture. I'm sure you're all aware of the growth in organic wine production. That's, that's worldwide. Uh, and certainly um, sales have been growing of organic uh, Rome wine for many years now. And by that, I mean uh, that the region has a commitment to eliminate chemical weed killers and pesticides uh, in the vineyards. But also, there's a big commitment in this area to biodiversity. There are several different projects that Interone are leading to encourage birds, to encourage bees to the region. Um, there's even a big project I was discussing the other day with somebody on nesting boxes for bats. And bats are really good because they do actually eat a lot of the smaller aphids uh, and flies, and um, they're, they're very much encouraged uh, in the Rhone Valley at the moment. Corporate social responsibility. Well, I think this is all companies and all wineries are included in that. This is more sort of direction of um, the packaging of wines. How are we packaging wines these days? Um, aiming to reduce the use of plastics, in, increasing um, recycling of um, materials, all those sorts of things are, are very much being implemented in the Rhone Valley. This was just a slide I had from Interone, which showed share of organic wine uh, across um, France. And you can see here that in the 2017 harvest, 8% of the wine of the Rhone Valley was actually organic. Um, that I'm sure that's increased by now. I'm sure that's nearer 10% in, now in, 20, in, in 2020. Um, but you can see here Provence are doing very well. 16% of Provence wines are now organic and increasing. So that's quite interesting. Okay, we're coming to just the sort of last parts of the um, presentation. 
and I'm trying to address the current challenges to winemaking and what's on the minds of winemakers here in the Rhone Valley. And I'm sure many of these things are um, also apply to uh, other winemakers around the rest of France. But climate change is always going to be a big one. Uh, in this region, it's how to handle those more random weather patterns that I was talking about earlier, suddenly getting a frost uh, uh, in, um, say, the end of April, or suddenly you get a, a really heavy hailstorm in May when you weren't expecting it. Um, we're seeing things like the hailstorms, the seeding of thunderclouds before they reach the vineyards, so that they drop the hail before they actually cover the vineyards. Uh, and for frosts, they're trying to, as they are in other parts of France, the braziers trying to have fires in the vineyards, trying to keep the temperatures up in those um, very cold, unexpected, uh, um, frosty days or nights. Drought is probably the biggest challenge to the Rhone Valley and the, uh, because the heat has just been increasing significantly. Last year, it's not been as hot this year as last year, um, but last year we saw temperatures of um, 47 degrees C uh, at the end of June, which wasn't planned at all. And, um, then we just have, we know that in July and August, it's a very dry period. And so the grapes last year were, were, were quite dry and small by the time they were harvested. This year, as I say, it's not been as bad as that, but we're having to prepare for drought. And there are big discussions going on between the authorities and the winemakers as to when they can, um, when they're allowed to use uh, uh, irrigation in uh, extreme circumstances. There are also the commercial pressures. As I said, the, as we saw earlier, the two biggest markets for Rome wines are the US and the UK. And we've now got a 25% tariff on all wines imported into the USA, which means selling them really ex extra difficult into the US. So sales there have been extremely challenged. And of course, with the UK market, the, the French are trying to grapple with um, how to cope with Brexit and what's going to happen with the trading arrangements post Brexit and what's going to happen to exchange rates. Um, all these sorts of things are on the wines of, uh, minds of winemakers uh, now. And now we've got the third C coming in, another challenge, uh, which is COVID. And there's the immediate impact on the harvest, um, which is a challenge. What happens if somebody in the winery gets COVID? And at, at the moment, the, the rules say that uh, if there is COVID in, the, in a workplace, that everyone has to self-isolate for seven days. Uh, well, of course, that's terribly impractical when you're trying to harvest, daily harvest grapes and to make wines over this period. So that's, that's quite a challenge. But looking forward, there are um, trade shows expected. They normally happen in February and March next year. Are they going to happen? Are people going to be able to, to fly and to travel? Um, how are they going to manage the relationships with their suppliers? Um, all of these are, are thoughts on the minds of, of winemakers at the moment. I must say that uh, one of the opportunities uh, afforded by COVID has been the bag in box. I know that uh, in the UK and certainly here in France, sales in bag in box in French supermarkets have gone up 300%. It's suddenly selling really, really well uh, in these markets. So lots of producers desperately trying to get their wine into bag in box and into the French supermarkets and the UK supermarkets to supply them. So it's not all bad news. And in fact, I wanted to finish, to try and finish on the positives. 
Um, I think the Rome Valley still has a great future for winemaking. Yes, we have still, we have to be prepared for more extreme weather events, but winemakers are doing what they can to adapt. And it's still a comparatively benign climate for grape growing. I think it's important to say that Interone is a, a very forward thinking and dynamic trade body addressing the issues of the community and they've got great plans in place for the future development of this region. The current president of Interone is Michel Chapoutier, who many of you will know for being a, a famous winemaker in the Northern Rhone, as well as some wines down here in the South and across the world. And he's quite um, a visionary and an inspiration. And lastly, I think it's, I think really the Rome wines continue to sell as they are well made, reliable, and good value wines. So that's all I was going to, to say about the presentation. Um, there is a last slide here. To thank WSET School London for hosting this presentation and for hosting me, giving me a chance to speak to you all. It's quite exciting to think there are 83 people out there all uh, listening to this. Hopefully you've got a glass of Rome wine in your hand. And again, there's the slide. If you want more information on the Rhone Valley, um, do look up the vanrone.com uh, site or if you want to talk to me, uh, send me an email and um, I will do my best to respond to you. So that's all um, I had in the presentation. So Richard, you've joined us there. Yeah, I just want to say a big thank you for that. It's great to get your insight and um, hear, hear how it is on the ground as well, as, as it were. Yeah, it's been, it was really fascinating. Now, I don't, have you got some time? There, are, there were some questions. Yes, indeed. Yes, we've still got plenty of time. I think we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Popping up if I work through the chat. So one, one, straight, one was, are the wineries still open for, for tastings? Yes, most definitely. Yes. So and they've got, they're at, at a social distance that everybody here um, adheres to a social distance of one metre. Um, and of course, the, you have your one glass, uh, and you don't you don't allow anyone else to touch your glass. But uh, yes, it's very much still open for business. Yes. Great. It's good to know. Then there was a question about the difference between organic and biodynamic viticulture. Well, as you know, Richard, you could probably do a whole presentation on <laughs> the difference yeah. between those two types, but. Um, organic wines tend to be the wines that don't use chemical pesticides uh, and uh, fertilizers and things like that. Biodynamic winemaking is a stage beyond that um, and as well as not using any chemical pesticides or fertilizers, um, the treatment of the vines is in conjunction with a, a calendar which looks at things like the phases of the moon um, and is a much more holistic approach to growing grapes. Um, I haven't got time to go into all the detail here, but I would say that uh, biodynamic wine producers on the whole tend to spend about four times as much time in the vineyards looking after their vines than a regular winemaker does. So there's a lot of care and attention that goes into the looking after the grapes in a biodynamic vineyard. Do you, do you know how many there are in the in the Rhone? The, the um, biodynamic. It's, that it's is. difficult to say. It's it's definitely increasing. Um, the uh, the most common label, if people are looking for biodynamic wines from the Rhone Valley, the most common label is called Demeter. And that's the label you'll see on the back of a bottle of wine. If it says Demeter, then it's been certified by that organization as a biodynamic wine. Um, I would hazard a guess, and I think they would probably be included in the organic figures. So I would hazard a guess that maybe about three or four percent 
of the um, wineries of the Rhone Valley are biodynamic. Okay, okay great. Uh, changing the subject from that, from biodynamic, it was a, a question from Tim about how Rhone growers are addressing control of alcohol in wines. Is this an issue locally or internationally? Um, again, this is a, a big area um, and I'll try and keep it brief, um, but the, the issue is that um, grapes like particularly Grenache um, come in quite naturally at high levels of alcohol. So the Grenache that would be harvested in the next couple of days is going to come in about 14 and a half, 15, 15 and a half percent alcohol. And that, there, um, you, could, you could argue, well, why don't you harvest it earlier when it's only 13%? The problem is that um, alcohol is only one component of the grape and other components such as the tannins are not ripe yet, which is why they're waiting. So they wait until the tannins are ripe, but unfortunately you end up with high levels of alcohol, particularly in the Grenache grapes. Now, things that you can do to address this, in the Southern Rhone, as I've mentioned, you've got the great benefit of being able to blend your wines. So if you've got, um, if you normally have a wine which is say 50% Grenache and 50% other grapes, and your Grenache comes in at 15%, um, and you don't want to, you know, you don't want to make such a strong wine, what you can do is increase the amount of other grapes in the blend and grapes like Mouvedre rarely seem to get above 13% of alcohol even when they're ripe. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a really um, year when you have got very ripe grapes in the Grenache you might be putting more Syrah or more Grenache into the blend and less Grenache. That's a kind of temporary thing that you can do in to manage in the winery there are longer term things that you can be doing, which is um, maybe for replanting, people are planting Grenache at higher levels um, and maybe even on north facing slopes um, in order that they don't get uh, so much exposure to the sun and so that the alcohol naturally will come in a bit less than uh, those high levels of 15 degrees. Great, thank you. I think moving on sort of slightly from that, Christopher had a, qu a question about exchanging um, portions of um, Syrah because um, it might have been a bad year for Syrah over to Verdure. So do you have any information on that, particularly in Chateau Neuf de Pat? Um, I don't know what the, uh, I will be honest and say I don't know what's going on with the Syrah in Chateau Neuf de Pat today. Um, I haven't heard that they've had a bad time. Certainly, they, uh, it's normally the Grenache that uh, gets affected by bad springs, um, and I haven't heard anything about, uh, about that this year for the Grenache in um, Chateauneuf. So, um, no, I don't know that, uh, of any concerns about the Syrah uh, in, in Chateauneuf. And certainly here in the Ventoux and, the, and uh, most of the Southern Rhone, I haven't heard uh, issues with that. Great, thank you. I saw Richard Lane put his hand up. Are you, Hello, yes. There, there you are. Hello, Hello. Hi, Richard, how are you? Fine, thanks, Richard. How are you, right? Yeah, good, thank you. Hi, Linda. It's Richard Hi, Lane. Hi, Richard. Hi there, Linda. Lovely presentation. Um, thank you very much. And I'm hoping to, to complete diploma fairly soon. So this is very helpful, timely. Um, my question really is about so Southern Rhone, two part question to do with, to do with the Southern Rhone. And more about its rep reputation, really. Do you think the rep, rep of Southern Rhone, which always seems to lag behind the Northern Rhone, is catching up a bit? And do you think the crew, excluding Chateauneuf du Pape in the Southern Rhone, are kind of getting on an equal pegging with Chateauneuf du Pape now? Because some of them are really, really good, aren't they? Like Gigondas and Carrion, I mean, and Rasto. There's some, there, there's some really good quality Southern Rhone now, as Rhone now, isn't there? But I sense generally it hasn't had, it hasn't been getting the appreciation internationally as much as the Northern Rhone? Um, well, that's, a, that's really quite a subjective question, I suppose. Um, I'm, mm. I'm biased because I'm in the Southern Rhone and yeah. uh, I tend to think of them as, uh, as being fantastic wines. And um, 
I Me think too. it's also a question, <laughs> it's going back to perhaps Richard, what I was saying earlier about the Northern Rhone being um, uh, a smaller uh, volume. They are only a small volume of production. Um, and so I think there is a little bit more of an exclusivity around those wines. And they've drilled down, there's a lot of work being done on the specific parcels of Syrah uh, and where they're located. There's a lot of work being done by the winemakers there to give the sort of um, parcel identity to some of the wines. Um, so I think that's going on. Um, I think you're right. I think there are actually nine crews in the Southern Rhone compared to eight in the Northern Rhone. Um, by a far away, it, the biggest is, is uh, Chateauneuf de Pape. But yes, you're right. The Gigondas and um, the other crew wines are catching up um, and, and getting more and more visibility. Um, they're doing things like uh, reducing, you know, trying to manage the yields, trying to do special, uh, special vintages. Um, certainly uh, in Chateauneuf de Pape, they're trying to do a premium range of sort of 100% Grenache style of, of wines at their top level. So, um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of visibility in the Southern Rhone, and I think they, they will certainly, they are as equal to the Northern Rhone in, uh, uh, in quality. Thank you. And just very quickly, what is your favourite crew from the Southern Rhone? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, if, uh, I, I love Gigondas wine, and that's so only I. about 20 minutes away from here. Um, but I often point out Lirac to people. Oh, fabulous. Because mm. it's on the right bank, and really very few people go and visit there. Very few people know their wines. As the crow flies, they're only 20 kilometers from Chateauneuf de Pape. Yeah, so they're, opposite, they're opposite Chateauneuf on the other side. They're directly just on the opposite. other side, yeah. Mm. But they just happen to be on the wrong side of the river and all the actions on the uh, left bank are Chateauneuf de Pape. And um, uh, uh, Lirac on the other side just uh, is, has got the similar type of uh, terroir, mm. um, but they don't have the same type of, uh, of visibility because they're not as big. Um, and certainly I've had real, um, real joy out of 10 year old um, Lirac wines, which have cost me nine euros a bottle. Yeah. So it's great value as well. So um, yeah, I put a, put a word in for Lirac as well. I'm glad you did because I like Lirac and their white yeah. Lirac is, is good as well as their red. It's very good. Yes, isn't it? yes. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Linda, very much. Good. Thank you, Richard. Cheers. Have you got, I mean, it's, there's, Amongst all the people saying all well, the wonderful um, presentation, there are a couple more questions, if that's okay. You... Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah. So um, there's a question about carbonic maceration, and is that a common practice in their own? Quick answer, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, and then a question about why is um, Provence so far ahead with organic wines? Uh, short answer, probably climate. Yeah, it's, um, you know, the, the, um, uh, in, in, in this climate that they're south of here, um, but often when I'm visiting winemakers, it's not a question of, um, I don't ask them sort of, have you thought about becoming organic? I ask people in this hot climate, why are you not organic? Because really, um, it's more the people in the uh, cooler climates which suffer more from the lack of sunshine, the increased rain, um, and they have more problem with bugs and um, with rot and with mildew. Uh, here in the south, you shouldn't have that. And that's, uh, as I say, why um, I think uh, that, that the south is probably the better area, the easier area for making organic wines. Great, thank you. And then I think of Final question from what I can see, unless anyone wants to um, fire one last one over that I've missed, is um, about sweet wines of the Rhone. And can you can you explain a bit more about them and a few popular names? Right, um, that's a good point. Yeah, on my pyramid that I, if you want to go back and look on the slide on the on the pyramid uh, in your own time, there are two crew sweet wines. The most popular is um, a, a wine made from the Muscat grape in the village of Baume de Venise. 
and the title of the appellation is Muscat de Beaune de Venise. Uh, and um, that's, a, a ver that's it's, uh, I think it's still quite an unfashionable drink, but I love it. Um, it's a, a great uh, wine made. Uh, they, they pick, they're the, probably the Muscat grapes, are probably the first grapes in the Rhone to be picked because they're picked very young and they're picked at night again when they're cold um, because they want to preserve that lovely freshness. And um, for those of you who've had a Muscat wine, you know that gorgeous sense when you put your nose in a glass of Muscat wine of um, lovely floral, lychee, honeyed kind of characters coming through on, in, in the wine. So that's uh, one one that's, uh, again, um, if you're in the UK market and you want to try the Muscat, Waitrose do the half bottle of Muscat de Beaume de Venise. Um, the other one is, the other crew wine is from the village of Rasto, which have a red sweet wine. And unfortunately, despite my attempts, I haven't been able to find this anywhere in the UK. Uh, but it's a sweet red wine made from the Grenache grape. Um, so that's, uh, that's perhaps one to look out for. If you can't find it, you're going to have to come over here on holiday and try it in Rasto. I'll take you to the village of Rasto. There you go. Well, that's an offer you can't <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, I think if we have, can we have one final question then that Come in when I go the final call out, and it was about do you do you have any producers you'd recommend as good examples of classic um, traditional versus modern to promote in the Southern Rhine? If you'd like to, oh. if you'd like to show a contrasting lineup, that's a that's a really difficult one because I don't know what you're you're trying to to do. Um, Chris the Bowie, there. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? I was just asking if the person who asked the question was still. <laughs> the, um, because each of the regions has traditional winemakers and, uh, and um, more classical winemakers, and then they have the, often the younger ones who are a bit more, uh, a bit more dynamic and um, making a bit more fruit forward um, styles of wine. Um, I have to say that, you know, when I was looking at this bottle of wine earlier, um, I really am not a fan of this whole medieval labelling uh, and scripts on the front of bottles of wine. It just looks far too old fashioned for me. Um, and that just smacked to me of, of kind of like traditional, uh, they're trying to appeal to a traditional market. Um, but uh, no, look at, the, um, look at the big producers. Um, I think if you're looking for someone um, traditional, you probably would want to go for someone in, in Chateauneuf-du-Pape, one of the big producers uh, like um, uh, Beau, Beau Renard or someone like that. Uh, if you were looking for someone a bit more modern, uh, why not try Chateau Pesquier, who are here in the Ventoux region. Um, they're winemakers, they're young guys and just making really nice interesting um fresh uh, wines and uh, very passionate about what they do so there's two recommendations great thank you i'm just sharing your email address to someone who wants a bit on the chat and um, there you go yeah there we are it's just at the bottom there <laughs> yeah great well thank you very much i think that that's oh there you go i think that's it for for the questions and yeah just thank you again for for joining us this evening and taking us taking us round the round the road it's been really interesting well i know you many of you can't travel at the moment so <laughs> i hope you've had a bit of a virtual tour of the rhone and uh uh yeah so go and open a bottle of rhone <laughs> wine cheers yeah, absolutely cheers everyone um, cheers. bye now bye bye and thank absolutely you. Keep a lookout for any future events. We're we're doing these sort of these webinars for for the foreseeable, really, until things things change, which they don't look like they're doing. So yeah, please do keep keep a lookout, and we'll see you again soon. Okay. Merci, Linda. Santé. Merci. Thanks, Linda. Au revoir. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Au revoir. Thank you. Merci. Au revoir. Thanks. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir.